fiery horse with the speed of light, a cloud of dust, and a hearty Hyo Silver, the Lone Ranger. Faithful Indian companion Toto, the daring and resourceful masked rider of the plains, led the fight for law and order in the early western United States. Nowhere in the pages of history can one find a greater champion of justice. Return with us now to those thrilling days of yesteryear. From out of the past come the thundering hoofbeats of the great horse Silver. The Lone Ranger rides again. Come on, Silver. Let's go, big fellow. I am Silver. The Apache drums had been echoing through the hills every night, and when Silver whinnied, the Lone Ranger and Tonto immediately put out their small campfire. A moment later, they heard slow hoofbeats heading through the woods toward their clearing. They led Silver and Scout into the cover of the trees and then waited, their guns ready. A single horseman rode into the clearing and dismounted beside the remains of their campfire. The Lone Ranger stepped forward. Up with your hands. Don't shoot. I'm only a traveler who's lost his way. I mean no harm. All right, Toto. Ah, I don't know him, not Apache. But you are... At least you're an Indian. Uh, I'm wearing a mask. Outlaws. No, you're wrong there. You're perfectly safe with us. Let's take a chance on the fire again, Toto. Silver will warn us if anyone else comes along. Ah, uh, me fix it. A few minutes later, the campfire had been rebuilt, and Toto continued with his preparations for the evening meal. The Lone Ranger studied their visitor by the light of the flames. The old man's clear blue eyes and white beard gave his face a distinction in startling contrast to his travel-worn buckskins. I've seen your face before. It may be that we've met. No, I've seen your picture. Isn't your name O'Connell? Weren't you a colonel with the Confederate Army? In the South, I'm still a colonel. I have a great respect for your courage and your ability. Oh, no. There you force courtesy to the breaking point. If you recognize me, it'd be impossible to respect me. Courage, ability... How can you apply those words to the man who led O'Connell's charge? It's been compared to the charge of the 600 into the Valley of Death. A good comparison. O'Connell's massacre. Why couldn't I have died with the men who died all around me? You almost achieved the impossible, sir. Impossible from the beginning. Oh, no one blames you for ordering the charge. That was your general's fault. It was one of the few mistakes your general ever made. No one blames me. Not even the wives and mothers of those young men who died. I've had the misfortune of looking into their eyes. You're wrong, sir. You had to obey orders. To take the valley at any cost. To drive back the Union forces to the far ridge. Did I have to obey that order? Couldn't I have shown real courage or refused? They say that when the leader of your first troop asked you if the charge were to be made, you were unable to answer him. You could only nod your head. I did nod my head, and I spurred my horse forward. 
And I never gave the order to retreat. But, Colonel, your men had the stuff heroes are made of. They wouldn't have wanted you to... Please, uh, I've fought that battle over a thousand times. I'd rather not talk about it. Oh, I'm sorry, sir. Uh, food ready, Tom? Uh, in a minute. Uh, which way are you heading? To the fort. My son, Tom, is with the ninth. He used to be Captain O'Connell during the war. Now it's Sergeant, but he'll make his way up. I came out here to see him once more before... Uh, listen. Apache war drum. You'd better stay with us tonight, Colonel. The less chance of running into a raiding party during the day. And Todd and I can show you the best trails. You make me wonder, sir. Oh, about what? You're obviously a gentleman. Why do you wear a mask? Well, that's a long story. Perhaps I can guess a part of it. Perhaps. Can it be that far from being an outlaw, you're on the side of the law? And concealing your true identity helps you in your work? That's practically the whole story. Sir, I'm honored by this meeting. The following morning, the Lone Ranger, Toto, and the Colonel worked their way down from the tangled hills. The sun was high in the sky when they heard the Apache war whoops in the distance. Oh, 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 oh. How far away are they, Toto? Over next ridge, to west. The Lormers. Ah. Colonel, a friend of ours has a ranch in the valley beyond that next ridge. You may have heard of him, uh, John Lormer. He raises the best horses in the west. You believe he's been attacked? Either that or the Indians are trying to run off some of his thoroughbreds. And you're going to his assistance? Yes. Now, all you have to do to get to the fort is follow this trail. And when it hits the valley, keep on traveling due south. I'd like to go with you, if I may. I can still shoot you, though. Now, you're welcome, Colonel. Get him, get him. As they topped the ridge, they could see a large cloud of dust to the west and another, a smaller cloud, a mile or two behind. Directly below, smoke was pouring from the ranch house, and half a dozen men were fighting to control the blaze. When the Lone Ranger and his companions reached level ground, the masked man led the way to John Lorimer, who was standing under a cottonwood near the house. Hey, look who's coming, the masked man! Boss, that's an Indian with him! I hope you find him! You know what you work? The masked man is a friend of mine! Oh, no, 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 well, it's been a long time, mister, but I'm sure glad to see you. Uh, we heard the war cries from the other side of the ridge, and we got here as fast as we could. Mary, my daughter. Mary was riding down by the creek when they attacked. They took a prisoner. They were Apaches. Yes, about 20 of them. And they were after your horses. Look, they got them all. How did they set fire to the house? Fire arrows. It's only the roof, no damage to speak of. It's practically out. You're sure your daughter was taken prisoner? We heard her scream. That was our first warning. Ten minutes later, it was all over. We saw Mary. They forced her to ride away with him. And you sent some men after them? No. My men are all here. No horses. But the Indians are being followed. We saw two clouds of dust just when we were up on the ridge. Soldiers. Sergeant O'Connell what? and his scouting party rode up 20 minutes after the Apache hightailed it. Tom, this is the sergeant's father, John. Oh, well, how do you? How do you do, sir? Your son's trying to cut them off before they reach the pass at the end of the valley. The Apaches have too much of a start. Then they'll keep after them. How many men does the sergeant have? There are eight of them altogether. Your son can use a few more guns, Colonel. He doesn't know me. Would you vouch for me? I certainly will. All right, let's go. Easy, sir. Easy, Colonel. Easy, Colonel. I promise you, John, we won't come back without your daughter. Thank you. Come on, sir. The colonel was riding a big raw bone chestnut with plenty of stamina and speed. The Lone Ranger and Toto only had to restrain Silver and Scout slightly to allow him to keep up. When they reached the opening of the pass, they heard shooting, and a mile farther on, they found the soldiers' horses ground hitched. Here they dismounted. They stayed close to the rocky walls of the pass and made their way cautiously around a bend in the canyon. Just ahead, Sergeant O'Connell was firing from the cover of a big boulder. The other troopers had taken cover on the other side of the canyon and were blazing away at the far opening. Tom! Hey! What are you doing here? We've just come from the Lormus Ranch. Masked man and an engine. Who are these men? They're friends, son. You can be sure of that. We're here to lend a hand. Uh, what's the situation? Most of the Apache are holed up just ahead. No sign of the horses or Mary. They must have set them on with a small guard. I keep down. Yeah, getting careless. They can stop you here for a long time. I know that. But there's nothing to do but blast them out. Another no trail over ridge. One mile to south. That right? 
Can we make it with our horses? No. It's too steep for Trooper's horse. Can Silver and Scout make it? Uh. And we'll go on. What do you mean? They'll cross the ridge and follow the horses and the girl. But there are only two of them. You said there could only be a small guard. We'll try to catch up with them. All right, go to it. We'll be coming after you as soon as we can get through here. Give it to him, man! The Lone Ranger and Tonto ran back to their horses, mounted and followed their back trail through the pass. Then Tonto led the way south to the trail up and over the ridge. It was a trail better suited to mountain goats than horses. But Silver and Scout never hesitated, and in half an hour they were on the far side of the ridge. Tonto dismounted near a patch of soft ground. Oh, scout, oh, fella. Easy, Scout. Easy, fella. Ah. Them drive horses this way. Hook prints not deep. Them not go fast. They think they're safe. Well, that gives us a chance. Ah. Easy, Scout. Easy, fella. Silver understands we're following a trail. I'm going to give him his head. Ah, that good idea. This rough country. Him follow trail better than Tonto. All right, go to it, boy. Get him up, Scout. Through the rocky hills, Silver picked his way with skill and precision, and Scout raced easily at his side. Mile after mile, until suddenly Silver threw up his head and slowed down. What is it, boy? Easy, easy. Oh, Scott, hope I'm not sure. A moment later, Mary Lorimer rode into sight around a rocky outcropping. Her palomino was being urged to its greatest speed, but an Indian rode close behind her, his tomahawk raised above his head. There was no chance for the Lone Ranger to shoot. Mary was in his line of fire, but the sight of the masked man and Tonto with their ready guns was enough to stop the Apache. He pulled up his Mustang, wheeled, and a moment later he was gone. The girl was sobbing as she rode up to the Lone Ranger and his companions. You and Tonto, we haven't seen you for nearly a year, and now this moment when I thought... Oh, I can't tell you the relief. You're all right now, Mary. Oh, where'd you come from? How'd you get here? You weren't with the soldiers. We caught up with them at the pass. Tonto and I came over the ridge. But where are the horses? Oh, they're just around this shoulder. There's a creek. They stopped to drink and the renegades were having a hard time getting them started again. I made a break and one of them came after me. I thought it was all over. Uh, how many Apaches are with the horses? Only three. Wait here for us. Oh, no, don't. Don't risk your lives. Let them have the horses. They're too good for Chief Little Dog. Stay here, Mary. One silver. Let's count. The Apaches were still trying to drive the thoroughbreds across the creek when the Lone Ranger and Tonto rounded the rocky shoulder. They opened fire. Their first shots missed. The Lone Ranger wounded one of them in the shoulder. The Indian immediately pulled his mount around, thinking only of escape. His companions followed him, and the Lone Ranger let them go. It was only the work of a few minutes to round up the thoroughbreds and drive them back to the point where Mary was waiting. What are you going to do with these horses? You can't drive them back through the pass. It's closer to the fort than it is to your father's ranch now. Don't I know it. But what's the matter with the fort? Why not go there? You look, Kimasabi. Oh, the Apaches from the pass. Here they come. Quick, Mary, dismount. Get behind those rocks. We better make a run for them. Easy, steady, big fella. Your horse is too tired. Hurry. Go on, Silver. Get the horses out of the way. Go on, boy. Them not see us yet? They will soon. It looks to me as if the troopers are after them. We try to stop them until they catch up. Now, Tonto, open fire. Ah. falls on the first act of our Lone Ranger adventure. Before the next exciting scenes, please permit us to pause for just a few moments.
Now to continue. Silver led the Lorimer thoroughbreds toward a clump of trees near the cliff wall, but they were still in plain sight when the Apaches thundered up the trail. The Indians evidently had no intention of stopping for anything, and as the Lone Ranger and Toto opened fire, the reason became clear. The troopers were nearly on top of them, and the Indians were not returning their fire. Obviously, they were out of ammunition. And when the Lone Ranger and Toto blocked the trail ahead, they raised their hands and shouted their surrender. When the Apaches had been disarmed and their hands tied behind their backs, the sergeant conferred with the Lone Ranger. I should be getting back to the fort just as fast as I can. Well, that's where Mary wants to go. That's the safest place for the horses. And Tonto, Scout Trail, you've got yourself a job. Let's go, men! The sky clouded over as they rode, and when darkness fell, it was inky black. There was nothing to do but let the horses pick their own trail. As they topped a wooded hill just below the long descent into Buffalo Basin, they pulled up. Then Toto went down the slope on foot. Uh, no campfires down there. That doesn't mean there aren't Indians. Lloyd. Yeah? Pass the word to those renegades. Not a sound. Right. You heard the sergeant. I'll put a bullet to the first one of you lets out a yet. You savvy? <laughs> It seemed to be hours that they waited for Toto. It was actually less than one. He reappeared as silently as he had left. Well, Toto? There are plenty Indian in valley. Toto think all Apache down there with Chief Little Dog. It's not safe. Go on. We've got to cross the valley. You can circle it. It'd take hours. Better to lose a little time and not get to the fort at all. And, Sergeant, have you asked yourself why Little Dog is here? He's got plenty of nerve. So close to the fort? He... You mean he's going to attack it? Could be. And think how easily the tables could be turned if the troops were to ride through that lower pass at first light, just as the Indians were getting ready to move. Smash the whole uprising. Yes. All right. We'll circle the valley. Colonel! What's the matter, Mary? It's the Colonel. He's lying down on the ground. Huh? His eyes are closed. What? Dad, what's the matter? Sergeant, this spot on his jacket, it's damp. Let me see. <gasps> the chest wound. That must have happened back at the pass. How to put bandage on plenty quick. It's only a flesh wound, but he's lost a lot of blood. Yeah, this changes things. He can't ride anymore. I can't leave him. You'll have to. But Mary, your men and the prisoners. I don't know. I'll stay here with your father. The horses? Leave them here, too. Just get the troops back here by dawn. Dad. He's unconscious. We'll take good care of him, Sergeant. I'm sure of that. All right, we'll get started. The sergeant waited until Toto had bandaged his father's chest. Then he rode off into the darkness with Mary, his men, and the prisoners. The Lone Ranger and Toto began their lonely vigil by the side of the wounded colonel. A bitter cold wind sprang up, and although the colonel had been covered with blankets, Toto was worried. Blankets, not enough, Kimasabi. Him need fire. Can we move him somewhere where we can build one without being seen? Mm, Tonto afraid to do that. Maybe two, three hour, it'd be all right. Not now. Well, we can't light one fire. The Indians would be up here in a second. Ah. But we could light a lot of them. Many fire? What would little dog think if he suddenly saw a dozen campfires up here on the ridge? Well, him think troop of soldiers camp here for night. Yes. And what would he do about it? Him not do anything till dawn. Would he attack then? No. No. That not way little dog fight. Him let soldiers see few Indian in valley. Small camp. All other Indian hide behind butte, behind rock. There are plenty places in valley. Little dog wait for soldier to come after few Indian. Then all Indian surround troop. That's the way I figure it too, Toto. Well, we'll build the fires. We let him think there's a full troop up here. We let him make his plans. But when morning come... And him see only us? The colonel can be moved before then, can't he? Uh Uh-huh. By morning, we'll be gone. In the meantime, the colonel will have the fire he needs. The Lone Ranger and Toto set a dozen campfires along the top of the ridge. They didn't light them one after another in a series, but first one, then another some distance away, then one next to the first, until all the fires were blazing high. It was only a few minutes later that the colonel stirred for the first time. 
Then he sat bolt upright and stared around him. Easy, Colonel. Oh, Major. Easy. There's no need to cuddle me, Major. I'm not as tired as you think. I've just returned from the general. Yes, sir. We have our orders. We're to attack at dawn. Yes, sir. In that case, you'd better get some sleep. Yeah? Sleep? Ah, uh, blessed sleep that knits up the raveled sleeve of care. If only I didn't know what tomorrow would bring. Hey, you, you'll wake me shortly before dawn, Major. Of course, Colonel. Uh, good night. Good night. Him have fever. Yes, delirious. I suppose this ridge and these fires reminded him of the night before he led his famous charge. Uh, him sleep now. To sleep. A chance to dream. Aye, there's the rub. There was no sleep for the Lone Ranger and Tonto that night. The hour before dawn came and they prepared to evacuate their patient. They saddled Silver, Scout, and the Colonel's horse. The chestnut was left standing beside his sleeping master as they rode away from the campfire to round up the thoroughbreds. This took nearly half an hour because they had to work in complete silence. There was a glimmer of light in the east as they rode back to the campfire. Both the colonel and the chestnut were gone. Colonel! They heard a ringing cry far down the slope. Forward! Across the valley! On to the ridge! Toto, he thinks he's leading a charge. Indians hear him. They'll see him soon. Silver and Scout plunged down the slope when the band of thoroughbreds who had accepted Silver as their leader followed close behind. The floor of the valley was reached. Now, Silver! Get him up, Scout! It was getting lighter by the second now, but a ground mist rose and swirled about them. The lone ranger and Tonto flashed by a clump of boulders. The first shot rang out. Now the lone ranger and Tonto had almost caught the hard-riding colonel. Take your right side, Tonto. I'll keep to his left. There was no need for more words between the masked man and his companion. To turn back now that the Indians had been alerted would be suicide. The only chance for survival was to reach the pass at the southern end of the basin. Tonto knew every inch of the basin. The fitful breeze swept aside the mist every now and then and allowed him to pick out familiar landmarks and avoid the great clumps of rock where the Indians had taken cover. The Lone Ranger and Tonto rode close to the colonel now, one on either side. The masked man studied the old soldier. His body was tense. His eyes were fixed straight ahead. The pistol in his right hand was raised above his shoulder as if he were carrying a sword. Forward! The colonel was living his famous charge once more. His whole being was intent on redeeming his great defeat. He must reach his goal, the distant ridge. On, men! On to victory! But his allies were slipping away. Not the lone ranger and Tonto who rode close enough to hold him in his saddle at the first sign of weakening. But the darkness and the mist, it grew lighter and lighter, and the mist was rising. A great butte loomed ahead. There's plenty Indian behind butte to the west of it. They slanted away from the sheer walls of the butte and were nearly half a mile to the west when they passed it. Over a hundred Indians were camped behind the butte. The Indians could see this was no cavalry charge, but only three men followed by a band of horses. They leaped on their ponies and, in spite of the range, opened fire as they rode. Wait for the pass now, Tonto. They'll try to cut us off. Get him up. Come on. The Indians had the shorter distance to ride to reach the opening of the pass, but their ponies could not match the speed of Silver, Scout, the Chestnut, and the free-running thoroughbreds. It was clear the masked man and his companions would reach the pass first, but the margin would be close, perhaps too close. In spite of the great distance still separating them, the Indians were firing steadily. The Lone Ranger held his fire until they were in range. He studied the leaders, hoping to recognize Little Dog. And at last he picked him out. He took deliberate aim and fired. But he never saw the result of his shot, because at that moment the colonel cried out. I can't make it, man! Go on without me! He swayed in the saddle. Quickly, the Lone Ranger grasped him around the waist and lifted him from the chest, not to Silver's back. But even the great stallion could not maintain his speed carrying such a burden. We can't make the pass now, Tuttle. Straight for the ridge! Take cover on the slope. Ah. They changed their direction, away from the pass, straight toward the ridge. They started up the slope, 50, 100 feet. The howling Indians were after them, eager for the kill. The Lone Ranger dismounted, lifted the colonel from the saddle, and placed him on the ground behind a rock. Ah. Go on, Silver. Up the ridge. Go on, Scout. Tonto took cover beside the masked man as the two prepared to fight to the inevitable finish. Them not climb ridge here. Them climb ridge to west. Out of range. Ah. Them get above us. 
That all, Kimasabi? We can't leave the colonel. We'll just have to hold out as long as we can. It'll only take Apache a few minutes to climb ridge. But the renegades were never allowed those few minutes. Just as the sun rose above the eastern rim of the basin, a bugle sounded in the distance. A tide of blue poured out of the pass and into the basin. The cavalry tunnel! Ah! The Indians rode hard for the cover of the big butte, but soon realized they must fight in the open. The battle was joined, and as the Lone Ranger and Toto watched it, the colonel stirred. Oh, Major. Yes, Colonel. Did we make the ridge? Yes, we did. How many men did we lose? Not one, sir. You can rest easy. A great victory. That's right, Colonel. A great victory. And it was a great victory. The Lone Ranger's single shot had wounded Little Dog. Without their leader, the Apaches had no taste for a pitched battle with the odds even. By noon, every one of the renegades had surrendered. The colonel opened his eyes to find himself surrounded by the activity of a busy camp. Tom and the regimental surgeon were kneeling beside him. Uh, That's better, colonel. You'll do now. Tom, you got back here in time. Yes, Dan. I'll see that he gets some broth. Make him keep quiet until the ambulance arrives. I will, sir. Tom, I had the same old dream. I was leading the charge again. But this time, everything turned out all right. We reached our objective without a single casualty. The reinforcements arrived on time. I can't tell you how good it made me feel. Just to dream something like that. It wasn't a dream, Dan. You did lead a charge all the way across the valley. You brought the Indians out into the open, and that made it easy for us when we got here. Not a dream? No. And I'll tell you all about it when you get stronger. But believe me, this charge will wipe out every memory of the other one. You see, this time you had a great aide riding beside you. Mary told me all about him, the masked man. This time, Dad, this time you were riding with the Lone Ranger. This is a feature of The Lone Ranger Incorporated, created by George W. Trendle, produced by Trendle Campbell Enterprises, directed by Charles D. Livingston, and edited by Fran Stryker. The part of The Lone Ranger is played